has been put off by in George's plaster cast sculptures is that the whole process of casting a living body freezes the vitality of the person in a most unnatural uh, state. And what you have for me, in my experience of those works, are these lifeless effigies. I think George's forte as an artist is as an expressionist. And the very technique required in making a cast of a living person is a kind of anti-expressionist process, which inevitably drains the subjects of their personality, of the whole vital aura that we respond to. And I constantly feel disappointed that I can't respond more favorably to this work. For me to decide to make a cast of a human being broke all the rules of fine art. Rodin was accused of casting from life when he exhibited years ago a torso of a human being. He was accused of cheating by casting from life. And I decided, damn it, I'm going to do it. I was convinced I could get away with it. I consider Seal as maybe one of the best sculpture of the second half of the century. Because, first of all, his policies of uh, direct casting give you the perfect direct image of somebody uh, who is just like us, like you and me, you see. And uh, for European people, it gives a very precise and concrete approach of the American every behavior. When you see a single piece, you say, well, that's the way American behaves in their own cities, you see. You feel that, you know. That's very a part of the American conception of democracy, too. Because uh, if you deal with uh, the great number of the people, if you deal with the mass, you have to be able to express things in a simple way. That doesn't mean that uh, he has no culture. He's a man of great culture, and that's why he can afford to be simple. Even though the museum is barding their precious property, frankly, everything off. In my own studio, I made them so that Lou and I could walk in, around, and among the figures. I built buildings myself to have 5,000 chickens and switched to use the studios for sculpture. I've clustered a few figures. I've opened up the space between other figures and I've carefully composed the empty space between objects. It's literal cubism for me. I had this chicken farm here, and entirely by accident, about a mile down the road, Alan Castro had rented a house. He was a proponent of environmental art and happenings. He called the father of happenings, in quotes. That time, back in the 50s, I thought that insofar as I was breaking some kind of ground I wasn't sure what, that I wanted not only appropriate words attached to that breaking, such as environment or happening. I also thought that the temporary was more interesting than the permanent. We had mutual artist friends from New York. We both knew the New York scene. And both of us, you know, this peculiar combination of uh, interest in radical new stuff, plus what tradition was about. So here's Capro. He was teaching art history at Rutgers and got me this uh, gig. When I became a freshman at Rutgers, uh, I found out that there was a sketch club every Wednesday. So I went and there was George who was teaching. And George would direct our little sketch club sessions, which basically, basically consists, I guess, of what I would think of as art school exercises with 
a model in a leotard. <laughs> Generally speaking. So we would go sketch and he would make some comments and so on and so forth. Then uh, we would go to this house. Uh, Bob Whitman was another student. Uh, and Alan Capra was a teacher. So the four of us used to end up sort of having conversations late in the night. I think for me, he looked at dangerous, you know, sort of mentally dangerous, <laughs> because he hated the chickens, and he also had to teach public school, some, some kind of teaching. He really detested that stuff. And Helen was, uh, I guess she had a hard time as he did, so it was kind of, sort of edgy being with them. I can remember seeing his exhibitions of his ritual chicken paintings, and I remember once uh, walking into the gallery, because I, I, I was in there every day, and there was an exhibition up of these expressions, paintings of a man with kind of different chickens around their necks, and when I saw those chickens, uh, I, I just thought, well, and I asked, I asked Bellamy, who was just dear, I asked Dick, I said, you know, what, what's this with the chickens? And he said, well, the, the artist is a chicken farmer, and he really, you know, he'd rather be a full-time artist. I was a member of an artist co-op gallery, the Hansa Gallery. And the artists showed there were people like Smarris, uh, uh, Capra, um, uh, Rock Whitman. Artists were very experimental, and they were about feeling and passion and emotion, and to some extent, I would say, a figure of extension of abstract expressionism. Every young artist is an outsider. Conversation with Capra, we discovered that if we became ourselves abstract expressionists, if you dutifully follow what has just preceded you, if you imitate your admired predecessors, you're doomed to, to be judged as a second rate derivative. Therefore, you, you damn well better uh, become yourself. Your head. How do I see the world? What do I understand? What do I know for myself about what I see? Uh, which is what everybody's problem is. Capra and I used to stay up until two o'clock in the morning arguing aesthetics. He wanted his work to be ephemeral, momentary, and I questioned that. George's aesthetic is quite different from Alan's. George is full of emotion, full of sweat, full of tears, and sorrow, and all that. Alan was full of wit and irony and coldness, you know. He almost like removed emotions from whatever he was doing, whereas George would sort of try to pile more on, you know. So I, I really liked the idea of them as uh, contrasting, contrasting elements. We had a day of happenings here. There are different people doing their own thing. Alan's happenings occurred us in the nature of a party. It was an army of cars dancing against this army of people armed with tree branches. I do remember Alan making a reference to Burnham Wood. I personally didn't get the image. And then there was a famous poet who was playing the flute. And uh, this, this was supposed to be the, the musical accompaniment to this war there. Sue and I used to talk constantly. It was an exchange point of view. And uh, uh, that also influenced our art back and forth. That provoked me. Uh, into <laughs> working up enough nerve to make an artwork into which I could walk or enter. He came off the canvas, reluctantly, I think, in the beginning. I studied painting in art school. I never took a sculpture course, strange enough. And I was taught the frame around painting was the boundary line, the border that separated this incredibly perceptive and intelligent artwork from the banal, ordinary world. And putting a sculpture on a pedestal was exactly the same thing. And 
incrementally, I rejected it. I was missing the reality of encounter. When he made the first statue, I'm going to call it a statue, uh, sculpture, uh, he didn't have access to the kind of materials he later had, and he was making it up, you know, starting to sculpt uh, the, the figure um, out of plaster. And God knows, building an armature, the way you're supposed to do and all that stuff. Remember the first piece that I saw in a show was this kind of hulking figure that was so crude. But there was kind of elegance to the crudity. Um, this was this was crude. I would say people thought they were kind of funny. Some of those early pieces, the lady on the chicken box, there you have something very connected to his past and, and a little ghost. You know, I mean, you can't get away from the idea that the white figures are uh, ghosts. He was painting. He was still chicken farming. The way you see his passion, I think, is in the fact that just just simply forged ahead and just kept it up. A little beauty on the attic of his house, for goodness sake. He was teaching in the New Brunswick Junior High, I think it was. And suddenly he had a show at the Green Gallery. And he sold out the show. And he came home and he told the teacher or the principal, whoever, he, that he was leaving after the year it was finished. Dad left his job teaching. My brother and I were still in grammar school. And my mom kind of had, like, her door must have dropped maybe a little bit. And then after a while, it was okay. Because it ended up that when he sold that out, it was as much as he made teaching. The early 60s. The early 60s were fantastic in that embrace of new attitudes. Described collectors as being more courageous now than they used to be. I think they really go along with a new idea earlier and further than they did, uh, say, in the time of Cezanne. I was approached by the uh, Sydney Jones Gallery. Sydney prided itself on handling the most difficult movements in modern art. Now, Sydney, who had been the abstract expressionist, dealer, realized that he had to do something else. And so he brought the French New Realist to New York. Sydney was one of the great connoisseurs of 20th century art. Any artist who was taken on by Janus ascended to a much higher status in terms in terms of the uh, reputation he commanded in the art world, uh, the market he commanded, and the way the press would follow his work. When the new generation came along in the 60s, and that was our first showing George's work, my dad said there was a lot of resistance to it. And uh, several of the abstract expressionists who were with the gallery left the gallery over that show, really. The new show was, of course, an enormous event in New York art life because that came at the climactic moment of the emergence of pop art in New York. I have a particular memory of Jim Stein's work in that show, which consisted of painting on the wall and then a rather rusty manual lawnmower that was attached to the canvas. And one of the members of the gallery staff was explaining to this woman who looked like a dowager out of a Helen Hokanson cartoon in the old New Yorker, uh, rather painstakingly explained to this woman that the lawnmower was just like the apple in a saison still life. <laughs> and I thought, well, we've come a long way, you know. Uh, in a way, I think George's work wasn't sensational enough to sort of grab the headlines in that new realism show. People felt he was the most serious artist in the show. That was the feeling at the time. Oh, Siegel, that is the most serious. No artist has ever done life-size sculpture with common objects from uh, the everyday world as part of the sculpture. It had a, another depth to it, a different kind of depth, although it was part of the movement in many ways. In New York City on 53rd Street, just west of 5th Avenue, stands the Museum of Modern Art. 
museum is really a showcase of the point of view. This one displays the foremost collection of modern art in the world. And in its new extended galleries, it's now showing works by the newest wave of modern artists, the pop artists. Their work is variously loved and laughed at. But one fact is certain, they are here now. Well, in the 1960s, television at CBS was black and white. And the major art expression in New York City was abstract expressionism. And even color didn't read on television. And I walked into the Green Gallery one day, and there was George Siegel's piece called Cinema, a life-size man holding his arm up, putting a theater marquee letter up on a huge luminous background. And I said, boy, this is very visual. It's absolutely wonderful, full genic and, and, and elegant. And I didn't know, but I'd walked right into the middle of what was the beginning of what was called pop art. And the great transition was taking place between abstract expressionism and, and the popular images of art. When pop art really emerged in a very public way in 62, 63, 64, uh, and proved an instant success with you know, with the public, with the market, with the academy, with everybody except me. Uh, uh, I think it has something to do with this appetite for you know, something interesting to look at that wasn't just a painted surface. There was a real appetite for visual incident, for visual drama, for something happening, something you could identify with. And I think George provided that for a lot of people. Our conversation with George Seal took place in front of a sculpture called Bus Driver, a life-size figure in white plaster, the real steering wheel forever frozen with a rigid ground.